But I want to read tonight about a guy named uh, Al Adamson. Al Adamson was a director and a low budget film director. He directed films like Satan's Satanists, Dracula vs. Frankenstein, and Hell's Bloody Devils. I mean, he just had an Easter basket full of weird stuff that he made. And he was kind of a strange, strange fellow. But he and Roger Corman, probably more than anyone else in Hollywood, gave a tremendous amount of work to folks going up and coming down in the film industry. Uh, you wouldn't get paid a lot, but you'd always get paid. And it was wonderful just to get a job if you're in LA, no matter what you're doing, camera or sound or acting. The biggest thing you've got to go through is getting a job. So anybody that gives work to people that want to make films is sort of halfway revered. And Al was one of those people, very strange guy, but everybody liked him because he'd give you work. And his pictures were always very weird and fun to make. So Al was murdered, and he was uh, killed by a guy who was working construction on his house. And I ended up being a uh, witness for the prosecution in that trial. So I thought I'd read to you a little bit how that occurred. Uh, first of all, people have asked me to describe Al Adamson, so I'm going to do that. This is. Uh, this is Al. Going to work on an Al Adamson set was like being in a movie by the grand Italian illusionist, Federico Fellini, and or working in a cheap seat cut-rate carnival. There were bikers, midgets, acrobats, ex-monsters, classical performers. There were Oscar winners, porno stars. There were usually deadly snakes around, lots of horses, dogs, donkeys, sometimes cougars. The morning I arrived on the set at Marine Land in California, it was dolphins and singing seals. Uh, the Fakers was the movie, and uh, it was uh, about to start filming. Cast and crew were sequestered in a small holding area near the main entrance to the West Coast largest oceanic amusement park. I was introduced to Mr. Anderson who enthusiastically informed me that as soon as the cameras were ready, I, as thug number one, and my partner, William Bonner, thug number two, were going to chase the lead actress, Anne Randall, ex-playmate of the month, through all the photogenic areas of the park. The chase would include a cat and mouse stalk through thousands of spectators gathered in the amphitheater to watch the morning show. This, according to Adamson, We'll give the picture a big budget look. It's gonna be great. You two wise guys go after the dame. She darts into the crowd and you lose her. We got 2,000 people for Christ's sakes. You go into the crowd, you shot people out of the way. Don't shot too hard, because we don't have a permit to be filming here. Uh, in the background, the seals will be singing away and the dolphins will be jumping around. It's gonna be fantastic. Well, that was Al Adamson directing. When he turned toward Anne to give her instructions, I took the opportunity to study him. Al was a likable character, about 6'2". He was reed thin. Uh, he had big blue eyes, a boxer's nose, and a prominent chin. He didn't look like a director. He looked like someone who worked in a hardware store in Fresno, California. Uh, his, his pants were too short, and he was what we used to call a white soccer, the guy who was the last minute desperation date for the prom. Al was not a social or political revolutionary. He never attended a concert of any kind. He never grew his hair past his ears, never smoked a joint, never wore an ankh, hugged a tree, or marched in a peace round. He was against sex and drugs, and he seldom drank, maybe a beer in a month. He wore polyester and liked both the police and the Marines. Al was so square, he actually qualified as a counter-revolutionary. And yet, Al that made those weird movies. Now, so that tells you kind of who Al Anderson was. Years and years and years later, Al had moved to Palm Springs, and I got a call from a cameraman friend of ours that said, hey, Al would really like to talk to you. He, he would like to hear from me. So I gave him a call. 
and we talked long into the night about the old days and the shining promise of the future. He was in a good mood, astounded that there were actually Al Adamson fan clubs bursting through the fertile soil of exploitation gardens worldwide. We discussed his wife, Gina, and her passing, and I got the chance to apologize for not being at the funeral. Al forgave me. His only bummer was an argument he was having with a fellow who was doing some remodeling on his house. The asshole has been stealing from me, Al said. He's also been running up my credit cards on his own personal stuff. I'm going to confront the son of a bitch tonight. If he doesn't pay me back, I'm taking the bastard to jail. That was the last time I spoke to Al. Several weeks went by, and then I decided to call and see how the confrontation with the bad guy went. A strange man answered and informed me in a deep, gravelly voice that Al is out of the country. He won't be back for several months. Three days later, I was in my driveway shooting hoops with my son Chris here in Austin. It was hot and humid. I walked in the house for a glass of water and heard the phone ring. It was actor Irvin Saunders calling from California. Have you heard the evening news? He asked, his voice tight. They just announced that Al Adamson has been murdered. Al Adamson loved his wife, Gina. He loved his dog, Stoopy. He loved movies and he loved basketball. He loved life. One hot, dry morning in July, shortly after our phone conversation, Fred Fulford, the carpenter, remodeler, entered Al's home and attacked him, hitting him over the head from behind with a hammer, killing him. The desert police called it blunt force trauma with a hard object. The natives called it El Gope de la Muerta, the blow of death. Al's body had been wrapped in a cloth, cocoon light, and buried 18 feet below his bedroom jacuzzi. It had taken them five weeks to find him. It is a popular room in that hot little desert town of Indio that at the time of his burial, Al was still alive. 